Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, the hyperkinetic movement disorder. The hyperkinetic movement disorder. But how do we approach a person who is having movement disorder? When a person has got movement disorder, it could be basically of two types. Hypokinesia, that is a decrease in movement, or hyperkinesia, an excess of movements. Basically, though the gross movements are done by the corticospinal tract, the fine movements, the control of the finer movements is done by the basal ganglia. And therefore, when the basal ganglia is disordered, either there can be hypokinetic movement, example Parkinson's, or hyperkinetic movement, example Korea. So basically, the movement disorders, the lesion is basically in the basal ganglia. So hypokinetic movement, the classic example is Parkinson's disease, which we have already discussed in the previous videos. So we shall discuss the hyperkinetic movement disorders. The hyperkinetic movement disorders, one of the most common hyperkinetic movement disorder is essential tremor. Essential tremor is the commonest movement disorder. But then the essential tremor closely resembles to that of the Parkinson's tremor. Parkinson's tremor and essential tremor may appear similar. So what are the characteristic findings which differentiate essential tremor from Parkinson's disease tremor? Essential tremor appears on posture, Parkinson's tremor appears at rest. Essential tremor worsens with action and therefore when we give a glass of water, when we tries to take it to the mouth and tries to sip it, the water spills over. Very important. Essential tremor worsens with action. Whereas Parkinson's tremor improves with action. So they may have resting tremor, but once they start taking a glass of water to the mouth and start drinking, they sip well. The water does not the water does not come out. So essential tremor worsens with action and Parkinson's tremor decreases with action very very important point so the parkinson tremor when they take water the water does not slip it does not spill over parkinson disease is a slow degenerative disease and therefore it becomes it begins asymmetrically it starts on one side becomes more in intensity and then spreads to the other side becomes more in intensity and finally they are confined to bed. So to begin with it is asymmetrical, it begins on one side but essential tremor may begin symmetrically and one characteristic feature of essential tremor is that it decreases with alcohol intake whereas Parkinson's disease has got no relationship with alcohol. In fact it has got relationship with smoking. Persons who smoke they have an excess dopamine release and therefore Parkinson's disease is less commonly seen in smokers. So alcoholism decreases the essential tremor, smoking decreases the Parkinson's disease, the chances of developing Parkinson's disease. Because Parkinson's disease is after all a disease because of deficiency of dopamine and therefore when this person smokes there's a, there's a release of dopamine. So the chance of developing Parkinson's disease is less in smokers as compared to non-smokers. So very important point, alcohol decreases essential tremor, smoking decreases the Parkinson's disease. The essential tremor responds to beta blockers like propranolol or primidone. Parkinson's disease tremor responds to anticholinergic drug. So very important, very common movement disorder is essential tremor and we need to know how to differentiate essential tremor from Parkinson's disease tremor. The next we see is the dystonia. To understand dystonia, we need to understand an important law. Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. According to this law, when the agonist contract, antagonists have to relax. 
otherwise a, an action cannot be performed for example if i need to lift the dumbbells the biceps will contract but the triceps have to relax then only i can lift the dumbbell if both contract together then i cannot perform the action of lifting the dumbbell so when the agonist contract antagonist have to relax this is the sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation so normally when agonist contract antagonist relax but generally they do not contract together they may contract together in two physiological conditions one standing when both agonist and antagonist contract or shivering when the agonist and antagonist contract but other than these few physiological conditions co contraction of agonist and antagonist is pathological we call that as dystonia dystonia is a co contraction of agonist and antagonist and a sustained contraction so dystonia very interesting phenomenon is that some people have learnt an art of bringing down the dystonia by various tricks known as sensory tricks in fact one person who was having the cervical dystonia was keeping the hand on the table for a long time and and that person has noticed that the dystonia has come down by keeping the hand on the table to the extent of developing ulnar neuropathy a compressive neuropathy so these are sensory tricks the mechanism we do not know for sure but then these tricks bring down the intensity of dystonia so dystonia is a co contract of agonist and antagonist muscles it is pathological we can see it on the eyes what we call it as blepharospasm because of the orbicularis oculi we can see it in the cervical dystonia we can see it in a very interesting manifestation as a very interesting manifestation writers cramps it's a very interesting phenomenon this co contraction of agonist and antagonist the same muscles appear to have the co contraction only during specific tasks like writing the same muscle groups that is the hand muscles used for other purposes like eating or drinking they seem to perform normally only when it comes to the task of writing they develop co contraction of agonist and antagonist that's why this is known as task specific dystonia very interesting same group of muscles act differently in different situation and in different tasks other than writing they seem to have no problem at all with the usage of the hand muscles only when it comes to writing there's a co contract of agonist and antagonist so that they can't write well this is known as writers cramps whatever may be the manifestation or pathophysiology of dystonia we can give botulinum toxin what of but it acts only for few months so this is about dystonia it is because of the co contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles then we come to another interesting disease where the liver and the brain are involved this is known as wilson's disease we see it usually in in younger age group the liver and the brain gets involved the eye and the cornea also gets involved the basal ganglia also gets involved it is basically because of the of the dysfunction of the copper metabolism the copper is generally transported by the copper transport protein ceruloplasmin and converted to copper containing enzymes like cytochrome oxidase but when the copper transporting membrane or protein is less that is ceruloplasmin is less the copper gets elevated and it gets accumulated in the eye which forms the kf ring or in the liver or the basal ganglia producing various manifestations so basically there is an excess of copper and it is not getting degraded into copper containing enzymes like cytochrome oxidase because of the deficiency of the copper transporting protein ceruloplasmin so it is an autosomal recessive condition usually seen in persons with less than 40 years the liver gets affected the cornea gets affected kf ring which can be diagnosed by slit clamp examination case of fracture ring the basal ganglia gets affected so they'll have movement disorders they can have psychiatric manifestations and then the bulbar musculature yeah, there seems to be a proclivity to involve the bulbar musculature and they can have dysarthria and dysphagia the diagnosis is that the ceruloplasmin the copper transporting protein is decreased so there's a low ceruloplasmin level the copper is high so the urinary copper excretion is high finally we have to confirm it by the liver biopsy 
where it shows an increased copper content. But very interesting is that on MRI, we can see the high signals, which is known as giant panda sign. The treatment involves treating the person with penicillamine and zinc. The next disease which we encounter as a movement disorder commonly is the Huntington's chorea. It is a triad. That's a, it's a autosomal dominant condition. There is chorea, there is dementia and behavioral disorders. So when you see this triad, we have to think of Huntington's chorea. Chorea is not able to maintain a particular position. It keeps up. They have an impersistence of motor movement so that for example, if they, it's like a milkmaid, they keep on or the tongue going in and out. So there is no persistence of movement, there is an impersistence of movement. One important uh, point we need to know about concept, we need to know about Huntington's chorea is that it's a trinucleotide repeat disorder and therefore there is an entity known as anticipation. What is anticipation? Anticipation is that the diseases occurs in successive generations and it starts getting worsened with successive generations because of the repeat in the trinucleotide repeat sequence. Usually it is transmitted from the father to the mother to the daughter and the lesion is the caudate nucleus. So easy to remember C for C. The caudate nucleus gets degenerated, we get the chorea. So obviously all these excessive movements as the Parkinson's is, is because of the decreased dopamine level, these hyperkinetic movement disorders are because of the increased dopamine and therefore we have to give dopamine antagonists like tetrabenazine. The other disorders which we, anchor, which we encounter is hemibalismus, the lesion being in the subthalamus, it is a flinging type of movement. Sometimes we see it in non-ketotic hyperglycemic condition also. The Tourette syndrome, gillis dehlor Tourette syndrome, they have vocal tics, they have motor tics, sometimes they can have vulgar utterances, coprolalia, but very surprisingly this coprolalia or vulgar utterances is less commonly seen in Japanese patients because of the good decorum they have, it is less commonly seen. And the other disorders which are commonly associated with gillis dehlor tourette syndrome is the obsessive compulsive disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Two conditions appear very similar like essential tremor and Parkinson's disease tremor which appear to be similar and we have certain findings by which we differentiate these two. The other two disorders, hyperkinetic disorder which appear similar and we need to differentiate with characteristic features are neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. The neuroleptic malignant syndrome is because of the excess of neuroleptic drugs or, or dopamine depleting drugs. Because of the dopamine depleting drugs, the hypothalamus gets affected. So they have fever, rigidity, hypertension, muscles go for high rigidity and therefore we have to do CPK, creatine phosphokinase level where there is a high CPK levels and the treatment involves giving dopamine agonists like bromocryptin, dantolin so that the so that the calcium levels, it blocks the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and relaxes the muscle. We have to hydrate the patient. The neuroleptic malignant syndrome also has got fever, hypertension. The closely followed condition is serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is because of the increased intake of serotonergic drugs like SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SNRI, select, uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor or MAOI, monomine oxidase B inhibitors or tripton, serotonin A is what we give. So again here there, there is an instability, again they also present with autonomic disturbances like fever, altered behavior, hypertension, fluctuations in blood pressure. So very difficult to differentiate between the serotonin syndrome and the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. But, but few differences which will help us to differentiate is that in serotonin syndrome, somehow the myoclonus is very prominent. So if you see myoclonus, it is more in favor of serotonin syndrome rather than the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So myoclonus is the feature we have to look for to differentiate serotonin syndrome from NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, other human signs like, uh, like increased deep tendon reflexes or Babinski sign 
and generally the certain syndrome has got a sudden onset and sudden resolution. The treatment will be obviously to uh, because of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors there is an increase in serotonin level so we have to give serotonin antagonist like kiproheptadine which we use as for appetite also which is a serotonin antagonist we can give diazepam to relax the person and obviously we have to remove the SSRIs which cause the depletion of serotonin. So Parkinson's disease tremor, essential tremor appears in there and we have to be vigilant to differentiate between these two conditions. Likewise NMS neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome appear to be similar and we have to use certain characteristics to differentiate these two. So these are all the important hyperkinetic disorders and uh, therefore if we approach the person with all these concepts in mind we will be able to better diagnose it better and treat better. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.